All right. Well, I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Uh, my name is not Michael Lee, for those of you looking at your schedule. Um, Michael Lee, my boss, has a newborn baby boy, and so he couldn't be here, so I'm here in his stead. My name is Ariel Mandange Fufu. I'm a data scientist at the Data Incubator, uh, which is a data science training organization, and we run a fellowship program that takes um, PhD students in analytical fields and runs them through a two-month boot camp to get them up to speed on what they need to be effective data scientists, or at least start out being effective data scientists. And we also do a whole bunch of corporate training type stuff as well. And my, my interests personally lie mostly in machine learning, um, human behavior type stuff, things like that. So unfortunately, I don't have Michael's NLP talk. Uh, so if you're here only for the NLP, I won't be, uh, I won't be offended if you leave. What I do have for you is a couple projects we put together recently that highlight uh, kind of practical workflows for machine learning in Python. Uh, so not just, you know, the regression, but all the stuff that comes before and after the regression to think through uh, an entire kind of end-to-end -end project. And I actually have two pretty interesting ones. One is a recommendation engine uh, for movies, and the other is anomaly detection um, from time series data. So my plan is kind of to go through these using Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, there, if you want to follow along, you can go to our GitHub. It's just github.com uh, slash the data incubator. And we have a public repo called PyData2016. And you can clone that and uh, follow the readme instructions for, uh, you know, if you have Conda already, it'll be very easy to get the environment set up. If not, you know, do your package management stuff. And uh, this will also be available afterwards, so there's no rush. Since there's only 45 minutes, or now 40 minutes, I'm mostly going to be talking at a pretty high level, and we can go back and check out the code later on. So if that sounds good to people, some scattered nods, some people looking forward to lunch. All right. <laughs> So how many people in here have done machine learning in Python before? Oh, excellent. So they weren't lying when they said this is an intermediate talk. Um, great. So we won't have to delve too deep into all the, you know, from first principles what we're doing. And uh, unfortunately, there are not going to be a ton of surprises because I ran a lot of these cells beforehand. But um, yeah, let's just show you what we did. So recommendation engines are pretty, uh, it's pretty broad what you mean by that. There's many different ways to build a recommendation engine, uh, many different approaches you can take. And we wanted to just highlight uh, just the way that we thought about approaching a very simple recommendation problem using both content-based and collaborative rating. And the, the data set we're going to be using is this MovieLens uh, 10 million data set. Uh, which is publicly available, and you can go download it yourself. And we have some nice piece of code here just to checkpoint to make sure that we don't download it every time. Uh, please just you know, tell me if you need me to, to slow down or anything. So we have this data file, and we uh, basically do some initial parsing and cleaning up of the data. So we're going to take uh, this movie, uh, movies data, for, uh, sorry, movies file, and parse it into a panda with categories, title, and year. So we can see that different movies are organized into different categories. We also have tags. So these are tags which users have put onto each movie. And we also have ratings. So we have user ID, rating, and movie ID. So far, so standard. So the first thing you might want to try is a content modeling approach. Um, you know, if a user likes adventure movies, we should recommend more adventure movies to them. Uh, but instead of just saying adventure or some other category, we can treat the problem a little bit more comprehensively and represent the category's feature as uh, a one-hot encoded matrix of uh, all of the categories, right? So now, instead of saying adventure equals one, drama equals two, comedy equals three, 
we'll just treat category as a, uh, or genre, as a categorical variable. And we will use this scikit-learn ability to write custom classes to just easily transform our categories, our list of categories, into dictionaries, where now we have a key, which is the category, and we have a one. And then if we pass this through a dict vectorizer, which is something, if you did come here for NLP, you'll be very used to, um, then what we'll get out is a sparse matrix with every movie and what categories uh, it has as ones and the categories were not assigned to that movie as zero. So for more beginning audiences, I like to spend a lot of time here and talk about how great it is that we have this infrastructure in scikit-learn to build custom stuff and how it would be a lot more difficult if we only had to pick and choose from the available options that were given to us. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, go into some rant about Python versus R and how important, you know, <laughs> how important it is to have that infrastructure available to you. But I think you're all on board from the start. So to use that infrastructure, I'll also take advantage of this pipeline. So if you guys have done machine learning in Python, you've probably used the scikit-learn pip uh, pipeline, which is a really neat way to sequentially pass inputs through transformers and then ultimately through an estimator if you want. So in this case, our pipeline is just going to be our dict encoder, which we wrote, and we'll pass it, apply that to the categories, and then we'll vectorize the result of that. And so this is just going to be a transformer pipeline where we now have uh, features, and if you can, uh, yeah, so features is now a sparse matrix. Right, everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay, so how do we approach this problem now of finding other movies that are like the ones that we have, uh, or, when, or like the ones that we care about? We have a way to describe a movie. We have this feature of all the categories in the sparse matrix. Sparse matrix. And one simple approach to take is just nearest neighbors. So if you're not familiar with the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, we're basically going to take our training set. Our training set here is represented as the red triangles and the blue squares. And when we see a new data point that we want to classify, in here it's represented as green, we will just look at all of the nearest other observations in our feature space. And so in, in this example classification problem, we would classify this green dot as part of the red triangle class because the nearest neighbors in the feature space were red triangles. And it's a fairly extensible algorithm. Um, you can think about doing things like uh, weighting uh, the vote of each nearest neighbor based on how far it is, right? So think data points that are very close have a stronger vote than points which are farther away. You can also do things like regression using this algorithm. You just take the average of all the nearest neighbors instead of uh, some kind of vote for classification. And there's also different distance metri metrics you can use. So here I'm just thinking very abstractly. You have some very high dimensional feature space and we're basically going to use the Euclidean distance to measure the difference between these two vectors in feature space and determine the nearest, uh, what is nearest based on that metric. But uh, if you want to get into it, you know, you can abstract this up to the Minkowski distance, which um, is another degree of freedom you can play with. And the interesting thing about nearest neighbors is it actually does do something during the fit step, which you might not believe it has to do. The fit step is actually pretty important for the algorithm to partition the training set uh, in a way that it knows what's close to which data points are close to each other. Um, if you can imagine what would happen if you had no information about your training set when you tried to run a prediction, your computer would start trying to calculate distances from that new data point to like every other data point in your training set, which may be many, many, many data points. It's a lot of computation. So what these algorithms do, and scikit-learn has implemented a couple different uh, methods for doing this, is identify regions of your feature space which are um, 
distinct from other regions. So that if I want to find the closest point to this green dot, I know not to start with the stuff out here in the edges. I know to start with stuff in the same region. And that's a very hand wavy way of describing it. Um, but that's another degree of freedom you have to play with. Okay, so that's k-nearest neighbors. And we're just going to use this for movies. We're going to say, we have some feature space uh, which somehow represents the categories that the movies have. So we're going to look at, for any given movie, what are the closest neighbors to that movie in the category space. So we'll pick out two movies for test cases, Toy Story and Dr. Strangelove. Um, because they're kind of different kinds of challenges. And you can see here what this looks like in the original data frame. And here's a bit of code that um, will just extract out the distances and the indices in the data frame for, um, for the nearest neighbors. So you can see that we have instantiated nearest neighbors up here with n neighbors equals 20. So we're looking for the 20 nearest neighbors, and we fit this as well. So now we're going to get out a list of 20 distances and indices. And we're just going to look at the indices in the original data frame to pick out, well, what are these nearest neighbors actually? And so for Toy Story, we see things like Kiki's Delivery Service, you know, Ants, Emperor's New Groove, Toy Story 2. Uh, so this does pretty well. It's not picking out uh, Pixar movies per se, but it's picking out similar kinds of things. But this kind of limitation is a little bit more apparent when we're looking at Dr. Strangelove because we get a lot of comedy war movies, but not a lot of them are similar to like the message of Dr. Strangelove. So we might want to give this model a little bit more uh, information. <laughs> um, one next thing we could try is the tag data. So we have a lot more information in the user applied tags. Again, this is what the tag data frame looks like. So we're just going to do the naive thing. We're going to one hot encode these tags, create features that associate with each movie ID, and, um, and do the same kind of process. And what that looks like is um, well, this is just showing you some tags. We don't need to do this. What that looks like is we're going to just do a join between all of the tags of a movie and the movie data frame, which we already have. So now we have in the same data frame categories and tag. And Pandas makes this really easy to do. And then we'll use the same kind of pipeline. And this is the kind of thing which uh, gets to be really fun when you're working with scikit-learn is that now you have multiple pipelines for different kinds of features. I can have one set of processing steps for categories, a different set of processing steps for tags, which here are called cat pipe and tag pipe. And then I can use a feature union to combine both of those resultant feature matrices into one big feature matrix which I pass into an estimator. So you can imagine that if you're working with data which is not just numeric, but you have text data, you have categorical data, you have all sorts of different things, time data, you can process all of those separately using separate pipelines and then use feature union to combine them. And it's really this combination of like sequential processing and parallel processing, which means you can build like any kind of tinker toy structure you want to with scikit-learn. And it makes it very, very powerful. So we're just doing the same thing we were doing before. We're just using this feature union to organize it. And then when we fit these features, we see now that we have over 16,000 columns. So the tags, there are a lot more different unique tags than there were categories. So now our matrix has a lot more columns in it. So we do the same thing. We train nearest neighbors, and we look for 20 nearest neighbors. And we look at what the model has said are the closest things to Toy Story. And it has indeed figured out that the closest thing to Toy Story is Toy Story 2 now. <laughs> but the other ones are maybe even a little less obvious. Um, this is the one with the squirrel in the airplane, I think. 
uh, Digimon. Uh, so it's not really that great. Doctor Strangelove is pretty similar. Yeah, question. Um, yeah. How long did that take to run? Because there's so many features. Uh, yeah, it takes. Uh, we can run it. I can actually uh, oh, run all the cells ab above this. Uh, it takes less than a minute. So let's start here. Run all the cells above this. It's going to take some time to um, to run these first cells, like parse through all of the data and stuff like that. So I'll come back and run that cell once it's once I see the little circle has done processing. Okay, so yeah, it, it's not that great still. And we think that the reason is that, oh, there we go. We think that the reason is that the tag space is so large, there's a lot of just empty, empty data, right? So we have so many unique tags, but most movies don't have a lot of tags. So that means that if we have a lot of these feature columns, which are all just like very little information, like there's no tags here, um, then they get marked in the nearest neighbors as similar to other movies which have like no tags. And if you think about nearest neighbors doing this Euclidean distance, you know, the feature column for tag uh, funniest movies is given the same importance as the feature column for the tag uh, romance category. So we've kind of maybe even diluted the predictive power of our model from before. Okay, so where were we? Eighteen. Okay. So now we can train this nearest neighbors model. And that's it. So I guess when it was less than a minute, it was actually stuck on a different cell. I'll try to keep running them as I go. So this is a pretty common problem that we come across when we're trying to do stuff, is we have a lot of information, but it may not all be relevant, uh, or it may not be organized in a way that lets the model easily distinguish between what we care about. So in this case, we have like 16,000 columns where we're really trying to capture ideas where there are probably less than 16,000 ideas. And that's a good indication that you might want to do dimensionality reduction. So um, this is something which in our fellowship, people often, you know, when we go through this stuff, we want people ask, you know, well, when do you do this? And the answer is whenever you think that this kind of situation is happening. So for those of you who haven't used dimensionality reduction, what we're essentially attempting to do is take something like the map on the left and change it into the map on the right, where we maintain as much of the usability of the map as possible. So for example, if I want to get around DC, I probably don't need that extra dimension of topological data. And we're going to see that not only does that make the model run faster, because as you can see, this ends up compressing your data set and making it faster to process. But it can also make the map look cleaner, right? And to the model, what this means is that instead of these 16,000 columns of largely cruft, now we have fewer columns where each column is maybe more meaningful. So we're going to use, um, we're going to use uh, SVD to do this, singular value decomposition. There are many different ways to, to, to approach this problem. Uh, a lot of them involve matrix decomposition, uh, which, uh, not to go into the math too much, but we're essentially going to take our feature matrix, look at how all those features 
play out in the feature space and figure out the directions in that feature space where those features vary the most. So if we look at this blob in two-dimensional space, we have one feature which is x and the other feature which is y. But actually there's better directions in this uh, feature space to capture most of the variance of the data. For example, this one and this one. And in fact, what we can do is identify all of those, um, all of those you know, principal components if we were doing PCA or eigenvectors if we're just doing SVD, and then just keep the most important ones. So for example, I could just keep this one long vector and drop the short one. Now my feature space would not be two-dimensional, it would be one-dimensional, it would just be a line. But there would still be a fair bit of variance in my data along that line. So I would lose some information, but maybe not all the important information. And so there's a lot of tuning that goes into this as well, uh, not just in the choice of how many principal components or um, most important directions of variance you want to keep, but also um, like which method you want to use. So I keep going, thinking about text data because this is supposed to be an NLP talk. If you're doing text data, you have counts. You really don't expect those counts to ever be negative. And so it might be more appropriate to do non-negative matrix factorization instead of something like this. And then in non-negative matrix factorization, your resulting feature columns are going to be guaranteed to be positive values. So in any case, we do this dimensionality reduction. And we're going to choose 100, arbitrarily. Not arbitrarily, but it was pretty much guessed and checked. And we'll just dump that into our pipeline. So this is really easy. We don't have to do this on our category pipeline. We, just have, we can apply it to just the tag pipeline. So oh yeah, I said I would keep running these cells. Oh boy. Let's just try running this one. So now we have a sparse matrix with 120 columns, right? So we specified 100 principal, not principal components, but the most important directions of our tag feature space. And then we still have the 20 from the category feature space. So we do the same exact thing. We fit the nearest neighbors and look at the results. And this time, we see a lot of Disney movies. Um, it actually looks like it's cleaned it up quite a bit. And if we look at Dr. Strangelove, we actually get more relevant things like The Great Dictator or MASH, Meaning of Life, arguably, uh, Full Metal Jacket, things like that. And when you do this SVD or this dimensionality reduction, if you remember that oval, we've kind of, instead of features X and Y, now we have some new feature that's kind of a mixture of X and Y. And this can be a problem for explicability, right? Because you don't want to tell your boss, I started with the number of rooms in the house and the square footage, but now my model's looking at a feature that's like room footage or something like that, some mixture of the two. So we can actually look at what, the new, um, what these new dimensions of the SVD are comprised of. And we can just extract that out of uh, the pipeline very easily. So we're just going to print out the top 10 for each one of these directions. And uh, there's a lot of nudity in a lot of these directions. But you can, if you go through this, see um, certain ideas that are uh, correlated together. So like here's 70 millimeter, quirky, satirical, irrelevant, humorous, disturbing. Uh, here's uh, IMDB top 250 along with National Film Registry. Kind of makes sense. A lot of the times that we see um, based on a book, we'll also see 
um, the other tag, like adapted from books, like based on a book, adapted from book, stylized, based on book. So it's like figuring out that there are some kind of, um, you know, instead of just having each one of these tags as a separate feature, there are ideas, right? This whole idea was the whole, whole thing was to get fewer ideas out of this 16,000 features. All right, so how am I doing on time? Uh, it's 12.15. 12.15. Okay. Well, we might just stick with recommendation then. Um, so, so far we're like pretty pleased with this. Uh, and this is like a good starting point, but you can obviously do a lot more. So we went to do a lot more. Um, we can do a good job of suggesting movies that are similar to an existing movie now with this nearest neighbors technique. And sometimes that's all you need. If you see a user buying Toy Story, you can recommend Toy Story 2. But we often want to suggest movies to a user before we know what they're buying, right? <laughs> so one approach would be to calculate an average movie that that user enjoyed, and then you use nearest neighbors to find all the related movies to that average movie. So what that looks like is we'll just get the ratings data frame here. And we'll look at one particular user. Uh, this guy seems to like horror movies. And then we'll just compute a weighted average. So uh, all we're really doing is taking all of these uh, taking all of these movies and averaging them out. And if we then go into our already trained nearest neighbors model and then pass in the observation for this weighted average movie, we'll see what the nearest neighbors are to that point. So we've just taken that green point. Instead of the green point being Toy Story, now it's some average of all the movies that that user liked or that that user rated. And so you can see that there are a lot of horror movies that are nearby, which makes sense. So do you then filter out the movies that the user has already seen? Yeah, if this was a business application, yeah. You might choose, um, well, there's a whole bunch of, of things. Like you know, sometimes you don't want to recommend the most obvious thing, but you want to recommend something a little bit in a new direction to try and give them something that they might not have seen yet, right? Or something that they might not have explored yet. And that actually is a good segue into the next part, which is collaborative. And we could use this to, you know, to find items similar to what a user already likes. But we often want to use the fact that we have many other users in our system to help. And what the idea behind this is that uh, if we can find a user that's similar to our target user, and we know what that user liked, then we can make recommendations based on that for what our current user is going to like. And to do that, we can still use nearest neighbors, except instead of figuring out what are the closest movies to any given movie based on these features like category and tag, we'll figure out what are the nearest users to any given user based on how they rated movies. So we'll assume that two users are similar if they've rated movies similarly. So here all we're doing is we're grouping by user ID and we're making into a dictionary um, all of these user ratings. And then we're going to pass that into dict vectorizer. So now we have, uh, and this might take a while too, now we have uh, like a whole bunch of users and for each user we have like a whole bunch of information about movies and how they were rated by that user. Dict vectorized into a, a sparse matrix. And this is a, uh, a point where we can actually do something a little clever and realize that when we're doing nearest neighbors before we've been using the Euclidean distance, right? So you have two points in this feature space, you see how far apart they are, basically using a straight line method. But for users, it makes a little bit more sense to use a cosine metric. In other words, we only want to know the angle between the vectors in feature space. And this is because some users just tend 
to rate movies on different scales than other users, right? Some user might rate things fives and fours and rarely give a one. Another user might rate things one, two, three, four, five. And those things are gonna have different magnitudes in this feature space. So we don't want that to necessarily relate in a different distance. So we'll just look at the angle between these vectors. And that's as simple as just passing in metric equals cosine to the algorithm. So um, there we go. And now we can look at, um, and this is a little dense, but essentially what we're gonna do here is take that model that we just fit. We're gonna get the UID here is the user ID of this horror user we're, we're looking at. And we're gonna plug his uh, part of the feature matrix into k nearest neighbors. So now we're going to get out all of the elements of this user rating data frame, which are the closest to uh, to this user. And it turns out that if we filter out this DF ratings data frame by user ID by the ones that are actually in the nearest neighbors, we can then group by title and look at the rating. And so what this is uh, doing is giving us a whole bunch of movie titles and um, all the different ratings for all of the people who are considered neighbors of that user by this cosine metric. And it turns out that there's 367 elements in this group. So what this looks like is something like this. Um, if we organize by the average, right, we look at the average rating for each one of these movies. We see that you know there was a user considered similar to our target user who rated Dracula five stars. The problem with using the average is that the top of the average list is always five when one person has rated that movie five and nobody else has rated that movie. So it makes it a bit of a problem because now the most uh, popular movies by this metric that we should recommend are ones that have only been rated once. So we could try doing something like summing up all of the ratings. Um, and if we do that, we get something that looks like this. But now Jaws is at the top because a lot of people have seen Jaws. A lot of people have rated Jaws. So all of those ratings add up. And now the most popular movies are at the top. And if there's one really cool horror movie that only three people have rated, like that's not going to beat a mediocre movie that everybody's seen. So. To solve this problem, we can do something called Bayesian smoothing. And uh, statistically, what we're doing is we're introducing a prior and then formulating a posterior estimate of the rating, taking into account both the prior and the new information from our, um, from our processing. Thank you. Um, what this really is saying is that if a movie has only been rated once, that obviously is not going to be um, as, uh, as relevant in our scheme as a movie that's been rated a bunch of times. But we can artificially give counts to movies so that we don't have as much as extreme of a problem. So instead of um, saying that a movie like the one we saw at the very top, Dracula, has only been seen once and its mean is five, we'll say, we'll give a few artificial counts to Dracula. We'll say every movie starts with like five counts, five reviews, and they're all three stars. And so what that will do is it will lessen the difference between movies which have only been rated once and movies which have been rated a lot because we've artificially added counts to the low end. And it will mean that instead of having Dracula rated at five, it's now rated higher than three, but not like absurdly higher than three because it was only one person who rated it. So this kind of smoothing is very common, especially where you have um, things that only occur a few times. Uh, like in restaurant reviews, you might only get the name of a certain dish once or twice, but you don't want that to be overshadowed by like the more popular dishes. So this is also something that you can play around with in Tune. Uh, you can tune both mu, which is what we're calling here 
the, uh, the mean where in the rankings movies with few reviews start to appear. And here we're just saying they should appear in the middle of the ranking. And then you can control n, which is this artificial number of counts which we're adding. Um, in other words, how confident are we that a movie which hasn't been reviewed much should be about average? So this idea is, uh, yeah, it's pretty popular. I see it a lot. So we can easily build this function here called base sum. And we'll just dump that into our ratings group. This is our group by object. And now we'll aggregate by base sum. And if we look at what we get out, so we still have jaws at the top. But we also see things which, um, which weren't there before, like Ghostbusters. And Ghostbusters isn't even really a horror movie, but it was rated very highly by some of his neighbors. And so it made it in, uh, a lot higher up the list. And there are a lot of ways to do cross-validation. I haven't talked a lot about cross-validation yet, but I've just thrown all these parameters at you that you can tune and not told you how to tune them. But one way to tune Bayesian smoothing is to look at how your list changes as you change these parameters. If you have a list of the top 10 movies and you change the parameters and the list is 10 completely different movies, then you probably are you have not quite converged to like a stable set of parameters. But if you change your Bayesian smoothing parameter and the top 10 list of movies doesn't change at all, then it means you're probably pretty stable. And you can like make a little uh, graph and say, I'm, I want to wait until um, the top 10 movies changes by less than 10% with each iteration of the smoothing parameter or something like that and use that as a kind of makeshift cross-validation. So, when you're playing around with this code on your own, some fun things to do. You can look at the effect of different, just different distance metrics on the recommendations, um, which I kind of alluded to before. You can also add in the year of the movie. This is something which is also a little tricky because is it true that a user who likes movies from 1970 will like movies from 1971? And what about 1980? And if it's a continuous variable, does it scale continuously or should each year be its own category? Um, is there a way to find a compromise between these two things? Like maybe you take your ranges as categories. So there's a lot of different options that you can try out. Um, and there's a little note here that just says, yeah, key nearest neighbor is a distance measure. So you have to be very careful about scaling all your data um, before you calculate the distance. Otherwise, larger years are just going to be farther apart than smaller years just naturally. And there's another big thing which we have left out of this analysis, which is that we consider not reviewing a movie at all to be less of a recommendation than scoring it a one. So maybe we should build in something that's like if a movie has not been rated at all, it counts as a three or, or something like that. Um, that might give us a little bit of a better result. OK, so I know I'm zooming through this, but I want to show you the last part which is regression. Often the first thing we do is, <laughs> the first thing we learn as data scientists, regression. But the last thing we're going to do here, we've developed a several ways to recommend movies to a user. But the fact is, most, most users have not rated most movies. Right? You rate some small subset of the movies, there's many more movies that you haven't rated. And what that means is that um, we, a, don't have a ton of data about how users will react to a whole bunch of the rest of the movies. And B, is it a sign that the user doesn't like those movies or that they just haven't seen them yet? So this is where modeling comes in, where we want to extrapolate from what we know to what we don't know. And we don't really know what a user is going to rate a movie that they haven't rated. But we can try to guess. And there's going to be two points to this. One is that if we guess what their ratings are going to be, we can then feed those guesses back into the analysis we've done before and get uh, perhaps better information about um, like the, the best average movie that is going to be what they like or whatever. 
but also we can just use the regression to uh, to predict. You know, maybe you've done your analysis at the first point and you've come. Oh, I think I should recommend this one. Let's see what the regression model thinks they're going to score this one. So. As you are probably well aware, we can do a train test split, and we're going to measure performance with root mean squared error. So I'll skip through that. And we're going to basically build a model that has three components at the baseline. One is the, um, the average of all ratings. The other is the difference between, for a specific user between the average of their ratings and the average of everybody's ratings. So if I tend to rate things fours and fives, I want the model to be able to pick up on that as opposed to someone who rates things ones and twos. And then I'll also have a term for the difference between a movie's average rating and the average rating for everything. So if a movie's very good, I want to have a term that lets the model pick up on that as opposed to just always recommending me good movies because they're good. I want the model to learn that good movies are good and bad movies are bad, but what may be relevant for the user uh, is not just the, the raw quality of the movie. And uh, if you're into like machine learning competitions and stuff like that, uh, you know, Netflix has this grand prize and it turns out that the winners of that Netflix grand prize most of their performance came from this baseline model. They made some improvements with the details of the algorithms and stuff like that, but the vast majority of the work is done by this baseline model. And what that means is that it pays to think about the baseline model a little bit. I mean, it's easy to get sucked into thinking about parameters and optimization and tuning and stuff, but it's often important to think about your original assumptions as well. So all we really need to do to train this is to one-hot encode the users and the movies and run linear regression. So that's exactly what we do. We take our, uh, our uh, handy dictizer custom class and we apply it to user IDs. We apply it to movie IDs. And we do a feature union to combine them and then we just run linear regression. And uh, we'll define some function here to um, measure root mean squared error. So, well, as a baseline to calibrate what we should expect, we'll just take a mean model, right? We'll just take a model that predicts the average for everything. And that turns out to have root mean squared error a little bit over one. Our baseline model, um, with which doesn't seem to have, I, I forgot to run a cell. This one. I may have just forgotten to run the train to this one. Down two. Down two. Ah. One. Uh, this one? This is 153 on the side. Oh, thank you. So we do a little bit better, about 20% better. And when we look at how we do on the training sets, it's actually substantially different. And that's kind of an indication that there's a big difference between our training our performance and our test performance, which indicates that we probably are overfitting. And if we look at um, the number of coefficients we have, over 11,000, <laughs> you can see we're kind of in the same boat that we were in before. Okay, so um, what we can do is we could, um, so I'm, I'm just going to wrap up here. So we could do something similar to what we did before. It turns out, handily, that regularization will do almost as good of a job, because if we add regularization to this model, then it actually gives us a term very similar to this Bayesian smoothing term. And so we can just add regularization, find this regularization parameter with grid search, and um, 
and then rerun the training. And we'll actually do somewhat better. So this has just been an example of, I think, mostly thought process. Um, you have some data set about movies. We wanted to build a recommendation engine. But you can see that at various steps on the way, there's things you have to think about, things which may trip you up, things which, if you ignore them, are going to skew your results. And these are the things that keep data scientists employed, right? Because otherwise, a computer could just do this um, by itself. So I hope that you uh, at least get a little something about how to think how we thought about this, and, and maybe that helps you. Um, again, the GitHub page is up there if you want to play around with this code yourself. There's another project I didn't have time for, which is anomaly detection of time series data, where we detrend um, city bike share ridership data to make it stationary as possible, and then basically to use a z-score to find anomaly dates in the bike ridership program. And if you go through that, you'll see that you can actually pull out like days where the ridership program was closed due to software malfunctions, or it was a particularly nice day in New York, things like that. And that also has like a lot of business uh, implications. So I will happily take any questions. Uh, if not, you're free to go to lunch.